Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you this morning. Yeah, good sound from over there. Thank you. Uh, It is another Sunday of our Building Faith series. And uh, we have these faith formation booklets that are available at the Welcome Center. And for every age group, there are ways to practice all four of the spiritual practices that we're teaching in this time. So I encourage you to pick one of those up. You may have noticed we have compost out in the raised gardens. Uh, It has an aroma to it. Farm kids, did you notice? And uh, this week we'll be putting in some of the perennial plants and next Sunday we're gonna have a courtyard cleanup day as well as some uh, also planting in the raised beds. They're not gonna count on us to do the major work. We're gonna help around the edges. So that's uh, something fun to look forward to for next Sunday after worship. Um, And so if you want to help with that, I recommend that you bring garden gloves, uh, a little trowel, maybe a shovel for wood chips, and a wheelbarrow if you have one to share. So that would be very helpful for us. It's good to be together today. I invite you to stand and we begin with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who is eager to forgive and who loves us beyond our days. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, together let us acknowledge our failure to love this world as Jesus does, God of mercy and forgiveness. We confess that sin still has a hold on us. We have harmed your good creation. We have failed to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Turn us in a new direction. Show us the path that leads to life. Be our refuge and strength on the journey. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Beloved of God, your sins are forgiven and you are made whole. God points the way to new life in Christ, who meets us on the road. Journey now in God's abiding love through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You'll notice that we have water themes in all of our music today as we uh, study the story of the Exodus and the crossing of the Red Sea. Let us sing together. Threaten our lives and livelihoods. 
so that we might forever place our trust in you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated and we will enjoy our next Thanksgiving video. Ooh, Thanksgiving for our car dealers. I'm here in our church courtyard and today we give thanks for this beautiful place. We thanks for the flowers and for all of those who plant and tend the flowers. We give thanks for our new patio furniture, for those who've donated and those who it honors. And we give thanks for all the ministry that has taken place in this space. Wednesday night youth groups, for Easter morning, for the Wednesday conversation groups, for vacation Bible school, for our after-school programs, we give thanks for this playground and for all those who play here, including the students from our charter school, preschool, and children's ministries, as well as our neighborhood children. We give thanks for all who help maintain this playground equipment, and everyone who donates to this project. We give thanks for these swings and for all the teens and kids who love swinging. For the new trees donated by Marigold Preschool to help our property be beautiful and safe. day parties, our last day parties, We are very blessed with all of our building and the property around it. And now I would like to invite our children to come forward for story time. Good morning. Good morning. Today I want to talk about rivers. Does anybody know what is the biggest river in Minnesota? Anybody know what it is? What's the biggest river. Do you know? Yes, it's the Mississippi River. Good job. And has anybody ever seen the Mississippi? Have you guys seen it? Oh, lots of us have seen it. It's pretty easy to see in Minneapolis. Has anybody gone to where it begins? Do you guys, what is the name of the park where the beginning of the Mississippi is? Matthew? Itasca, that's right, Itasca State Park. And there is something super cool you can do at Itasca State Park. What is the coolest thing you can do there? Mm, there's a lot of cool things. There is a fire tower, there's good hiking, there's good camping, but there's lots of mosquitoes. If you've been there, you know there's lots of mosquitoes because there's a lot of water because you can see where the Mississippi actually begins. And when you go to the beginning of the Mississippi River, there's a place that you can walk across it. 
Has anybody ever walked across the Mississippi? You guys have. Yes, I have too. What's it like? Mason, can you tell us what it's like to walk across the Mississippi? It's cold. How did you walk across it? Did you just jump in? No, what did you use to help you cross it? A log. You walked across a log. That was a good idea. I remember when I was there, there were rocks. You could walk across the rocks. And then you could get a sticker or a t-shirt that said, I walked across the Mississippi. And that's a big deal because what you can't see up there is how very, very big the Mississippi gets. When I was there last time, there were some people putting in canoes. They were going to canoe down the Mississippi, but even, what? How far, how far do you think they can canoe down the Mississippi? A thousand miles? I don't know how many miles. Did you have an idea, Mason? How far, where does it get out? Where does, where's the end, do you know? Yeah, the Gulf of Mexico, yep. So you could take a boat all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. And in fact, I did meet those people. They were, that was their plan. They were gonna canoe all the way down. But there's much bigger boats that go there too, really big boats. Like, oh yeah, big paddle boat, yep. And, and there's houseboats, yep. Yes, yes, and there's barges, and they move a lot of things, and recent, yep, yep, and, and tugboats, you guys know a lot about boats, and I just read, yes, Isaac? Oh, you know, you're right, I'm not sure I've seen a pirate ship on the Mississippi River, but they do now have cruise ships, so you can take a cruise all the way down the Mississippi. Yeah, Disney Vacations. I'm not sure Disney Vacations goes down the Mississippi. My point is, <laughs> my point is that there, the river gets so big that at some point it would be impossible to walk across it. We can walk across it at the very top, but down in the middle, it would be impossible. In fact, very, very dangerous because it's wide and it's deep and there's lots of big boats. You can't walk then, right? Then you're taking a boat. So today we're going to hear about God's people, the Israelites, and they wanted to walk across a river, a really, really big river. It was called the Red Sea. It was a great, great big body of water. And they um, thought that this would be impossible because there's so much water and it's deep. And not only did they need to walk across it, they needed to bring their babies across it and their animals and all their belongings. And it seemed impossible. How do you think they were able to get across this big body of water? What do you think, Tricky? And they had to ford it, yep, just like an Oregon Trail. Yep, maybe they rode on them, but that wasn't it. What do you think, Manny? Oh, the whales could pull them. That would be a good idea too, but, but that's not what they did. Yep, you could use a boat, but that's not what they did. You guys, you guys have a good imagination. Yep, but how could they walk when there's so much water? They could have rocks, but there weren't enough big rocks. Or a bridge, but they didn't have time to build a bridge. They were in a hurry. You know what happened? God made a path. God made a path for them to cross this great big body of water. They got to walk across on dry ground. This was a huge miracle. And I'm sure that most of the people on that walk hoped that God would build them a bridge or send them a boat or somehow make it easier for them to cross. But that's not what God did. God said, I will be with you even though this is scary and hard. I will help you do something that seems impossible to you. So now not all of us have the job of walking across a river or a big lake or something that seems impossible. But we do have other things that are hard. 
Jessica has something that's hard. Yeah. What do you have that's hard? Riding on a boat as hard might be scary. Sometimes some of us have a test. Sometimes some of us have to um, go someplace we aren't, don't want to go, like maybe to the dentist or something. And we wish God would make a way, a bridge, a way to just get past it super fast. But God doesn't always do that. God says, you know what, it's important you go through you go to the dentist, it's important you go through this test, it's important you go visit the person you didn't necessarily want to go visit, and I am going to be with you. Yes, Trigby? Water skiing, water skiing is a good option. <laughs> yeah, I know your mom has a water skiing story. So, the, what we want to remember is that sometimes there are hard things, but God will make it possible for us to get through it. Maybe not over it, maybe not around it, maybe not skipping it, but getting through it with God. It's important we pray and we trust that God will help us get through it. So let's pray right now. Lord Jesus, you know we have lots of hard things in our lives. And we pray sometimes that we could avoid those hard things. But today we remember that even if we must go through them, you will go with us. Hold our hand, Jesus, and help us get through our hard things today. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming up. You can go back to your seats. Today's reading is from Exodus 14, 5 through 7, 10 through 14, and 21 through 29. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the minds of Pharaoh and his officials were changed toward the people, and they said, What have we done letting Israel leave our service? So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 elite chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone so that we can serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to keep still. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by the strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord, in the pillar of fire and cloud, looked down on the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into a panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hands over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall on them 
on their right and on their left. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, if any of you here were a part of the U.S. response to the Vietnam War, uh, I, I want to let you know that that's what part of this sermon is about, uh, but it's about the secret war that took place in Laos. This is a Hmong story cloth that was given to me by Hmong Hope Community Church, who was a tenant in one of my churches when I served on the east side of St. Paul. It depicts the end of the American CIA's secret war based in Laos against North Vietnam in the 60s and 70s. This war was fought secretly during the Vietnam War, secretly fought with U.S. help from soldiers, weapons, and financial support without the knowledge of the United States beyond the CIA and Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. Uh, for those of us who grew up in that time, uh, the nightly news was always a report from Vietnam, and there was always a report of how many soldiers had died that day, but that did not include any numbers of those who may have died in service in Laos. The first story clause of the secret war were made by women at the Ban Vinye refugee camp in northeastern Thailand beginning in 1975, and which closed in 92. Some waited in that camp 17 years to leave a temporary home. Commonly, a Hmong story cloth is sewn, the first ones, on a blue cotton background like this one. The outer edge border of triangle pieces, I hope you can see them, symbolize the protective mountains of Laos. And they use brightly covered, colored embroidery floss to make satin stitches to tell the story. As with many Hmong story cloths, mine depicts from top to bottom the advancement of the North Vietnamese troops through air and ground attacks. You can see a white airplane in the upper right-hand corner. The destruction of their homes living on the run in deep woods and jungle, jungles and mountaintops. And then camping along the Mekong River waiting for a time to safely cross. And at the bottom, life in Thailand in the camp. Still surrounded by soldiers, but now safe from attack of North Vietnam but also impoverished, malnourished, and at risk of predators. As pictorial representations of, narr of narrative story cloths uh, often convey not only wartime and migrant experiences, but they also serve as a means to tell other stories. Folk tales, oral histories, and farm life can also be topics of story cloths. But today I'm focused on how the Hmong people are processing trauma of the secret war through the handiwork of women in refugee camps. They had an exodus-like journey from oppression and violence to hope, and it took a long time. Nearly all the story cloths of the escape from Laos depict the dangerous crossing of the Mekong River, a Red Sea type of experience for the Hmong people. Now, the Hmong people do not have their own state. As you know, there's no country called Hmong. They trace their ancestry back to China and its southern provinces, and they began migrating south in the 1800s. Most Hmong settled in the highlands of northern Laos, establishing small villages and providing for themselves through farming, fishing, and hunting. Recruited and secretly funded by the American CIA, Hmong soldiers totaling over 30,000 men fought the North Vietnamese from crossing into Laos to circumvent the DMZ and extend the war geographically. Now, as you can see on this map, the black lines are the Ho Chi Minh Trail that North Vietnam designed to help them invade South Vietnam. And the DMZ, which we heard about every night on the news, the demilitarized zone, was where we kept a hard land uh, battle going to keep them in North Vietnam. But they, if they could get into Laos, they could get around the DMZ and invade South Vietnam. The secret war in Laos was to stop them at the border with North Vietnam. They fought the ground war, they flew combat missions, they directed airstrikes, they rescued down American flyers, they fought behind enemy lines, 
and they gathered intelligence on the movements of North Vietnamese troops and more. For a decade and a half, Major Gen Vang Pao and his Hmong guerrillas fought alongside the Americans. 1968 and 69 were the two worst years for both the American War and, in Vietnam and the secret war in Laos. 18,000 Hmong soldiers died in two years. And significantly, we need to remember that their sacrifice kept 70,000 North Vietnamese soldiers busy trying to get into Laos, and they could not spend their time trying to get into South Vietnam. The Hmong people were devastated by the war. Uh, United States Air Force Colonel Walter Boyne wrote, the Hmong families were driven from their homes to CI-supported hilltop encampments where they were fed by rice drops. It was a situation that went on for so long that Hmong children were said to believe that rice was not grown, but simply dropped from the sky. Now these two pictures, next pictures that I portray Long Chien, it's a secret military base established by the CIA in Laos on a normal day during the war at the top where they're um, removing and repacking munitions and the same air base as the last C-130 flight departed in May 1975. Many were able to leave, yet thousands were left behind. There was a desertion of people left to fend for themselves. There were no systems in place to defend, escort, or provide shelter for all these people who sided with the CIA in the secret war. Of 300,000 Hmong living in Laos at the start of the war, about 40,000 were killed in action, another 3,000 miss missing in action. An estimated one-fourth of all Hmong men and boys died fighting the communists in their country. And because the war was fought on their own soil, another 50,000 Hmong civilians had been killed or wounded in the war. That's more than a third of their total population. In comparison, the official US military death total in the Vietnam War was just over 58,000. So let's pause for a moment and uh, remember those who die in war, no matter what the war is or where it takes place. Why has the United States worked so hard to support Hmong refugees? As former CIA Director William Colby said, for 10 years, General Vang Pao's soldiers held the growing North Vietnamese forces to approximately the same battle lines they held in 62. So from 62 to 72, they held that border and kept the North Vietnamese very busy. Amen. So listen to these words of Hmong American poet Mai Durvang, write, writing on the 40th anniversary of the fall of the air base and the start of the Hmong exodus from Laos. In her writing, I hear echoes from the biblical story of the exodus of God's people we read in the second book of the Bible. She wrote, as we look forward, forward beyond the loss of our homeland, we must build a fortress of Hmong identity that can withstand the effects of exile and diaspora one that won't mourn what could have been, but instead transforms the trauma into what we can fully be. We see that here in Minnesota. Like the Hmong people, Moses and the Hebrew people had to find a new way of life in a new land, and it was a long journey for both. The Red Sea exodus for the Hmong people of Laos included, as does much of our biblical story of the exodus of God's people, migration, exploitation, identity formation, traumatization, liberation, fleeing oppression, facing new challenges, seeking a new home. What has enriched Minnesota from the exodus of the Hmong people? As of 2019, there were 81,000 Hmong refugees and their descendants living in the Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area. It is the largest urban Hmong population in the United States. Think of it, when you combine the totals of other Hmong people in the United States, it now surpasses the number that lived in Laos at the start of the war. 
And then I have to tell you uh, my favorite line about Lutherans in any movie. Clint Eastwood made a movie to, in 2008 called Gran Torino. And he, in a very grumpy neighbor fashion, says to the neighbor, his Hmong neighbor, how did you get here anyway? And the neighbor said, the Lutherans brought us. <laughs> and he responds, everybody blames the Lutherans. How many times has the story of Exodus repeated itself in other times and places? And how many places in the world right now? Ukraine doesn't necessarily involve crossing rivers, but it is at a time of mass exodus, as it is, has been in Afghanistan and Venezuela, among many others. We need as many as possible of us to ask of God, how can we help? How can we help the exiled, the refugee, the one oppressed among us? Our Board of Spiritual Growth will soon propose how our congregation may be ready to help in refugee resettlement in the Twin Cities. Just think about it on a worldwide basis. Approximately 22% of the world's refugee population live in refugee camps. An estimated 6.6 .6 million people. So what's in this Exodus story from the Bible and those we read about? Well, one, it exposes the privilege and the mechanisms or instruments or devices of imperial power. The most powerful system at work often oppresses and exposes the privilege it demands at the cost of others. And it illustrates that God is always on the side of the oppressed. God is always on the side of the oppressed. The Exodus story includes imperial domination and political violence, familial ruptures, displacement, isolation, genocidal death, ecological devastation, as well as salvation and creation and wandering and wilderness worship and covenantal renewal. This painting by an uh, uh, artist named Poussin is a composition of the Exodus story with Moses having his hand raised, as we imagine, as through him God completes the parting of the Red Sea. The Israelites are shown in the aftermath of the event, both awestruck and celebrating because they have escaped Pharaoh's army. The Israelites recover from the waters. Poussin has meticulously drawn 89 figures in this painting, yet he managed to order, keep and maintain an order in the composition. We think of other historical exoduses in our history. Human people brought from Africa and other places to be sold and owned by other humans escaped plantations to seek freedom in the northern states of the U.S. Harriet Tubman, a slave from Maryland, who after being nearly killed by her white master, fled and devoted her life to making other slaves free. She started the Underground Railroad, and when a bounty was placed on her head, they never got to take it. She died at almost 100 years of age in 1913. Harriet was a liberator of enslaved Africans in the U.S., often dubbed the Moses of her people. She too collaborates with water and with wilderness to ensure the freedom of enslaved and oppressed persons in diasporic and exilic settings. Known as the Underground Railroad, Harriet navigates marshes and woodlands to escort enslaved Africans to freedom. Like the function of the wilderness in Exodus, sites along the railroad served as temporary hosts to escapees endeavoring to gain their freedom. She, like Moses, and like the people who were forced to flee Laos, traversed water terrains that could have killed them. And in a book titled, Let My People Live, it makes a daring claim that life can be created out of death, but also as a function of processes that redesign and transform to various degrees the structures of oppression, whether nationally, globally, or imperially. Here's a quote on dra trauma and healing. Trauma is a result of an overwhelming sense of danger, powerlessness, and fear. And healing is a result of feeling safe, empowered, and supported. Exodus stories expose the privilege and instruments of imperial power 
and they illustrate that God is on the side of the oppressed. That works out in large government systems, even in our country, in lots of ways. Sometimes government works for good to support the oppressed, and sometimes it does just the opposite. In recent weeks, Florida's governor had asylum seekers in Texas flown to New York and Massachusetts and other cities without full disclosure of what was happening. Most of these asylum seekers were from Venezuela, where ongoing turmoil of political and economic issues has brought more than six million people to flee the oppression in their nation, people who had no political or economic power. Six million people dispersed along that border of South America, Central America, Mexico, into the United States, and other places in the world. These asylum seekers who managed to reach Texas were registered and then encouraged to board a plane and were dropped off without notice into another part of the U.S. with no one prepared to expect or meet them. We could say that our borders are being overrun with refugees and asylum seekers. We could say that our border states bear a great burden in processing and assisting these people. We could say we want to teach people a lesson, but in, by inviting people off the street with inaccurate or incomplete information was traumatic and oppressive to the people on planes going who knows where. To be dropped off at an airport in another city where no one expects your arrival, like 70 Venezuelans in Martha's Vineyard, is cruel and oppressive. We need national ref immigration reform in our nation, but this is not the way. To emotionally harm people already traumatically, uh, 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 traumatically oppressed is overwhelming. It goes against the will of God. And God, as we know from the Exodus story and the life of Jesus, is always on the side of the oppressed. So I give you this assignment the next time you watch the news, whether it's the 24-hour news channel that always has to have something to tell us and how breaking news seems to be happening 24-7, or if you're watching the nightly news, ask this question. Who are the ones honestly oppressed in this story? Who are the ones honestly oppressed in this story? On our own, we cannot make sufficient change to help the oppressed receive basic human rights in all cases, uh, or a path forward to prosperity on our own. But God asks of us to work in collaboration with God and with each other in times of exodus, in times of salvation, in times of creation. And Jesus' best instructions for us on this is his words. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Let us strive to live out God's commandment, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Amen.
remembering the powerful and saving works of God, we pray for the church creation and the needs of our neighbors. We pray for the church. Bless the missions and ministries of diverse congregations that they effectively share your good news in their contexts. God of grace, hear our prayer. We pray for creation. Send rain to lands experiencing drought and healing to places devastated by hurricanes. Enrich the soil, protect the crops, and provide resources to rebuild lives. God of grace, hear our prayer. We pray for all who govern. Encourage those in power to lead with empathy, forgiveness, and care. Remove authority from heartless, self-aggrandizing dictators. God of grace, hear our prayer. We pray for our neighbors who face illness of any kind, for those strained financially, for all living with chronic pain, mental illness, the disease of addiction, or otherwise afraid or in harm's way. Protect all who cry out for mercy. God of grace, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for this congregation. Open our hearts to welcome diverse neighbors. Help us to forgive each other, practice patience, and approach differences with grace. Move us to care for those in our community seeking refuge and safety. God of grace, hear our prayer. Remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these and the prayers of our hearts, trusting in your compassion made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please share a sign of God's peace with one another. As we consider our response to God's word and blessing among us, we realize that God doesn't need our money. Everything belongs to the Lord. However, as people created in God's image, we are blessed to be able to share our resources with those who do need it, people, creatures, and our earthly spiritual home. The ministries of First Lutheran Church depend on your generous donations to continue our services in Jesus' name, which include feeding the hungry, welcoming the stranger, and encouraging spiritual growth in all. May you be blessed as you live into your calling as God's image on earth. Donations may be placed in the baskets on your way forward or given electronically online. Let us pray our offering prayer together. Gracious God, in your great love, you richly provide for our needs. Make of these gifts a banquet of blessing and make us ready to share with all in need. Through Jesus Christ, who sets a table for all. Amen. And now we prepare the Lord's table. Please rise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now let us pray with the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All people are welcome to dine at the Lord's table this morning. You will be ushered forward, given a piece of bread, and then you may choose red wine or white grape juice. We will have a gluten-free station available as well. And if you do not want to eat this meal, come and receive a blessing. Come and receive Jesus, our strength in the wilderness. You may be seated as you await your turn at the table.
And now the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. God of the abundant table, you have refreshed our hearts in this meal with bread for the journey. Give us your grace on the road that we might serve our neighbors with joy for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Again, welcome to worship this morning, especially if you are visiting, whether in person or online. We rejoice that your spirit was with us today. A couple of announcements. Our Young Adult and Youth Mission Jamaica trip deposit is due next week. If you aren't entirely sure what this Mission Jamaica trip is about, we are going to have a meeting the following week on the 16th at noon. Or talk to me or Rachel James, our CYF director, and we would love to tell you what we are doing on this trip. Our Rome and Holy Land tour is also going to be leaving next year. This one is leaving in March, and we are also having a meeting on the 16th. So the Young Adult and Youth Mission Jamaica trip meeting is at noon, but the Holy Land and Rome trip, the meeting is right after worship at 1115. So even if you're just curious, come to one or both of those meetings. Also next week is Courtyard Cleanup. So if you are able to help out with the cleanup following worship, bring your own gloves and a wheelbarrow if you have one, and Nathan will put you to work following worship. Now please rise for the blessing. God, who gives life to all things and frees us from despair, bless you with truth and peace, and may the Holy Trinity, one God, guide you always in faith, hope, and love. Amen.